Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools, lecture number 25, how individualization alters each of the other training principles. We looked at the variables that individualization affects the most in the last lecture. This time it's on for principles, specificity, overload, fatigue management, stimulus recovery adaptation, variation and phase potentiation in that order. How does individualization alter the application of specificity? First is the needs analysis, which is the core of specificity is going to be very different between individuals. And over time, do should a person train their pecs more? Should they train their quads more? Do they want their arms bigger or their calves smaller? It's a thing that is going to be different between individuals like crazy. All right, so that's some big thing to pay attention to. Specificity is very, very altered in that way by individualization. And then directing program design to reflect priorities. Is raw stimulus magnitude what you're looking for best because you have, you know, really to grow a lot of muscle, you really want to grow and you don't have a big fatigue gap and you have all the time in the world, like an undergraduate lifting in college for the first time during the summer semester. Is it uh, STR that you really want? You know, do you have a limited time to train and thus you have to smash a lot of stimulus into a very limited time? Or is it SFR? Are you someone who's really heavily invested into this? You have time to train, but your fatigue is starting to be a cap because you're getting stronger and bigger. Those will be very individual questions and they will alter the specificity of your program based on how you design it. Uh, one last one is, you know, how many of your activities compete with hypertrophy? Program design for specificity for someone who also plays soccer five times a week is going to be very different from someone who just bodybuilds and that's it. Overload. Individual differences affecting the overload principal application. Volume landmarks are absolutely critical here. Okay, what is MEV for someone might not be MEV for someone else. What is MRV for someone might not be remotely very stimulant for someone else. And they differ between different muscles within the same individual. Okay, your biceps might need at least three sets per session to grow. Your hamstrings might need six sets per session to grow, and there's no telling which one it is. Only autoregulation can tell you that. And there's differences in the same individual over time. It used to be your pecs grew from 10 sets of chest a week. Now you need 12, and then later you need 15 sets of chest a week to make noticeable gains. The same amount of training is not always going to lead to robust gains because Muscles adapt to that kind of stuff over time. As long as you're in the 30 to 85% 1RM range, volume is the main driver of hypertrophy. So there has to be a lot of volume autoregulation with that that can really accommodate these overload differences. If you apply a certain volume and it turns out individuals are not getting a ton of stimulus, they're not getting a ton of fatigue, you can probably do more. If they are getting a ton of stimulus and a lot of fatigue, probably doing the same or even less is a good idea. Only through autoregulation, something like the set progression algorithm from earlier lectures is going to be able to tell you that there's huge individual differences. There's no guarantee that what's overloading for one person is going to be overloading for another or for what was overloading for one person earlier is going to be overloading for them again later. Fatigue management, super straightforward, volume landmarks, and keeping shy of our MRV. People have very different MRVs, and what is a volume that someone can survive comfortably is a volume that will wreck somebody else. Huge thing to keep on a look out there in applying fatigue management. Another more intricate one, is very interesting, is the ratio of muscle versus joint and connective tissue recovery might be different in some people. Some people have muscles that recover very fast, that is like they don't even get sore, but their joints and connective tissues don't. So their muscles won't get sore, but the joints and connective tissues after a few uh, sessions of training get kind of beat up and it takes a while for them to recover. You might choose to do lower frequency training for folks like that. Some folks that have muscles that recover very slowly, but joints and connective tissues that recover very, very quickly. So for them, you might actually want to limit how much you do per session for the muscles, but you can use more hardcore movements, uh, you know, like that would stress the joints more without fear of recovery. And you might be able to pull off higher frequency training. And of course, you know, for some folks, muscle and connective tissue recovery occurs at a very similar time scale. And for those folks, the training program is much easier because you don't have to worry about joints and connective, connective tissues really, really falling off. Um, these might change over time. 
right? If you are not super strong yet and your muscles aren't very big, they can recover very quickly, but so can your joints. As you get bigger and stronger, your muscles can slow in their recovery, but not a ton. But your joints and connective tissues, because you're so much bigger and stronger, can really slow in recovery. And all of a sudden, that ratio is different, which means, and we'll get to this in a bit, you might have to take different ratios in your phases of accumulation to deload. You might have to do more active recovery phases, more maintenance phases, because your joints get beat up more than they did relative to your muscles. Stimulus recovery adaptation. Training frequencies can differ radically between individuals, especially male to female and larger to smaller. Females, especially smaller ones, neither disrupt their muscles a lot nor their joints a lot with any given session. And thus they can do five or six sessions a week for the same muscle group and recover hunky-dory no problem for months on end. Larger males, especially that have been training for a long time, might be in a position where some muscles, the quads, the hamstrings, the chest, may only be trained really hard once a week and an easier one or other one or two other times of the week because they can do no more than recover from that because the SRA curve is just that long for them, specifically on the fatigue side. The way to do it properly is take a best guess at what you think is going to happen. So if you have a female client that's 100 pounds just you know, three months into her lifting and she hires you as a coach, probably wouldn't train her once a week per muscle group. That's kind of stupid. But if you have an IFB pro come to train with you and he's already 260 pounds and he's very fast twitch, former collegiate sprinter, you're not going to be like, hey, let's put you on a six day a week split where you train every single muscle uh, once a week or uh, uh, six times a week. That would be insane. So take your first best guess. Then auto-regulate frequency based on their recovery with, you give them a certain amount of volume per session, see when they recover, certain amount per session, see when they recover, and see how clustered the recovery is, keeping the muscle and joint connective tissue ratio in mind. Because their muscles could recover with you know two days of rest, but their connective tissues might need three days of rest to be better. So a more sustainable program would have to take that hit and on average be lower frequency than you may have wanted. Next, and this is sort of uh, another implication from the last lecture, different muscles within the same individuals can be very different. Uh, people say, you know, how often do you train arms and how often do you train chest and back? Well, you may train chest and back twice a week, but you may train arms three times a week because your arms recover so fast. And it could be vice versa. People say, how often do you train legs? Well, you may train hamstrings double as often as you train your quads or vice versa. You may train calves every day, but who the hell would train their quads every day, right? There are differences within the same individual between muscles. So don't just assume I'm going to do, you know, wait, what frequency are you running? Like 4X a week, every muscle group, like that might not be the correct answer to things. It might be that every muscle needs something different. And over time, frequencies per muscle within an individual can change. It used to be that you trained your back four times a week. Uh, but now you've gotten much better. Your fitness has increased, your technique, your SFR, you're more intelligent with your training, your load management is better. Now you can train it five times a week. And then later when you get much stronger, the sessions are more disruptive, connective tissue takes a toll, you're back to four sessions a week. So that can change SFR and detecting what's going on with performance and soreness and so on and so forth is a huge, huge role to play in making sure you get the right best guess every other week on how much frequency you're doing and for sure every other mesocycle. Variation. Uh, what are the best exercises? Which ones? Someone asked uh, me on Instagram. What are the? Is there a list of the best SFR exercises? No, and there cannot be such a list. There can be a list of average over population best SFR exercises, but that's not very instructive if that exercise just happens to suck for you. So there's a huge difference between individuals over time. Yeah, some exercise is going to have crappier SFRs. You know, the BOSU ball, one leg, pec extensions are stupid, shitty SFR, and then, you know, properly executed deficit push-ups are a really great SFR for most people. It's super different with individuals and over time. For example, I used to get a ton out of overhead tricep extensions until my shoulders got so big that I, my elbows are pulled out. I can't physically pull my shit in anymore. It's just my pecs get in the way and everything gets in the way. And all of a sudden, that's not a great SFR exercise for me because while it stimulates the triceps pretty well, though I lost range of motion because my biceps got too big, not as well of stimulus. And it's a super awkward position and my joints hurt more and I'm super uncomfortable and I have to use a ton of weight overhead. We could be doing, you know, I've done like 225 overhead tricep extensions before for a set of 10. Ugh, like the SFR on that is just not great. But it used to be like when I was doing that with 115 pounds and I was smaller and I could bring my elbows in, it was the greatest exercise I've ever used. So things change over time. Don't be like, man, I just don't feel pec flies anymore. What the hell is wrong? 
that it's okay, try your best, but if you don't feel them, switch to another exercise, you might uh, feel much better. A lot of the reason, not all, but the pros use very different exercises sometimes, really weird setups. You're like, why is that guy setting up that weird, you know, one, one arm row variation where he could just do a normal one? He might not be able to because he's so big, he has to pull around his body. New variation is the only thing he can actually do. So it can change over time. SFR, consistent reanalysis of stimulus to fatigue ratio is the only guarantee that you're going to be doing a good job over time. Don't assume that these are the good variants. These are the bad ones for yourself or for everyone and just keep going. Loading zone bias. Some uh, folks are going to really like to train much more heavy. They're going to get the best SFRs heavy. Some folks moderate, some folks on the lighter end. There's no right answer there. It's what's best for you. And this can change over time as well. A lot of times, folks who are beginners will be insufficiently strong to get a lot out of very high rep sets. On the other hand, folks that are intermediate that were getting a lot out of high rep sets but not lower rep sets develop a mind-muscle connection and a really, really good technique so that when they go back to lower rep heavier training, they take that with them. You know, as an intermediate, the lower rep sets, you're just like, okay, I'm moving point A to point B in these squats for sets of eight, like whatever. My technique is fine. I don't have to feel anything. But as an advanced lifter, you may be so in touch with your muscles and the biomechanics and the technique and have such a great personal technique. But sets of eight are awesome for mind-muscle connection now, and they didn't used to be. So these things can change over time. Don't deify anything. Don't put any dogma into it. Always be on the lookout for slight changes and slight alterations, even in your own training, for how much of it is heavy, how much is moderate, how much is light. And this applies as well between individuals and within to exercise orders. Some people can start with an isolation, go to a compound, everything's great. For some other people, it might just zap them and it makes the compound go not so well. Cadences. Some folks love slow eccentric and some people think it's a total fucking waste of time. Like not think, but feel that it's a total waste of time and they may be very well correct. Some folks earlier in their careers might not have liked slow eccentrics, but later in their careers developed a real affinity for them because their SFRs are better and training modalities, drop sets, supersets, et cetera. We already talked about in the last lecture, male versus female. Uh, females usually don't get a lot out of drop sets, supersets, et cetera, but males do, but that can change over time. You may not have used to get a lot, gotten a lot out of supersets, but now you've uh, mind muscle connection is better. Your technique is better. You found the right things to superset. Two exercises you didn't think you should superset, you do, and all of a sudden it's a super golden zone. This stuff changes and is different person to person to person. So when folks ask me, for example, what's your favorite superset? Sometimes I share that, you know, my favorite tricep superset is XYZ, but I also say like it's not always my favorite because it gets stale and also it may not be your favorite. So really, really good thing to... Uh, to look out for. Lastly, as far as the training principles are concerned, is phase potentiation. This is a huge one. This slide and this super quick 30 seconds I'm about to do justice to it may be one of the more important things you ever hear as far as program design uh, on certainly on this channel on YouTube. Here it is. The mesocycle length. People say, how long should a meso be? You know, roughly four to eight weeks. The meso length is going to be hugely individual. For some people, any more than three accumulation weeks in a row is a total disaster. For some people, that's just when they're getting warmed up. Huge individual differences there. So there's no dogma there. Number two, mesocycles, number per block. Some people can do five progressive mesocycles in a mass gaining block and be totally fine. Some people do two and they fall off the face of the earth. As long as both people are doing their best, there is going to be, there are going to be differences. And over the career, there are going to be differences. You may have used to being able to do 20 consistent weeks of hard training, but now that you're bigger, stronger, and so on and so forth, and especially your joints and connective tissues and total system get a bigger beating, you may not be able to do five anymore. Maybe now it's four, and maybe later it's three, and so on and so forth. Resensitization and active rest phase length. Look, if you're a beginner, you resensitize uh, for one week. Okay, a week of deload is as good for you as it is for an IFB pro taking a month away from training. But on the other hand, that IFB Pro may need that month. They may not want to take a month off of training or a month of easier training, but they have to in order to resensitize. It's different between individuals. Nutrition phase length and the intensity you bring to your nutrition stuff. Some people can gain a pound a week and it's mostly muscle for weeks and weeks. Some people gain half a pound a week and it's mostly fat and they have to go even slower or just take, take the fat on the chin. Some of the lengths, some people can do a 16 week fat loss diet, feel hunky dory, no crazy cortisol stuff, no crazy hunger. They lose a bunch of fat, super good. Some people can get even leaner than those people, but they need to go in shorter bursts. So they may do a 12-week diet, take a maintenance phase, and then do another 12-week diet because they know they can't hang for 16 weeks. That is a difference that will come up. 
right? So again, there's no broad swath of things that work for everyone. It all has to be to some extent individualized. Degree of muscle group specialization. Some people will be able to have a systemic MRV that's so high, they can specialize all their muscle groups at once for years and years and years and just make great gains. Other individuals, after getting to be intermediates, their systemic MRV is so low that they really have to start cycling muscle groups. Okay, it's upper body focused for the next several mesos. After that next several mesos, lower body focused. And there's a lot of tinkering that goes on because they can't smash it all in. Big differences there. And of course, loading range bias across the block some folks can start with just a little bit more heavy stuff and pretty close to moderate light stuff and then switch to exactly the same of all three and then a little bit less heavy, moderate up a little and light up a little towards the last mesocycle of the block. Some individuals, the most of their work is heavy in the beginning, a little bit of moderate, tiny bit of light or even no light work. The middle block is 50-50 moderate and heavy. The next block, they're just done as far as getting anything out of heavy responses or joints or trash. There's very little heavy training, if any, plenty of moderate training and a ton of light training to really push metabolites. Uh, myself and uh, uh, my colleague Jared Feather here at Renaissance Periodization, I like a slightly more even approach. He likes a nice big pulsatile approach. There's not a correct answer there. It's very, very individual. So a couple of final implications from this lecture. No individual is exempt from the training principles. Okay, so there's no one there that doesn't need to manage fatigue. No one doesn't have to apply overload. Specificity works for everyone. But every individual needs this applied a little bit differently with attention to their needs and responses and abilities. This is true for any single individual between one individual and another, and it becomes more important as training age increases. The more, if you give a decent program to a beginner, they're gonna get great results. If you give a decent program to an intermediate, they're gonna get decent results. If you give a decent program to an advanced lifter, they may get no results or even regress, okay? It would just get crappy results. As you get more and more advanced and you reach your genetic ceiling, individualization becomes more and more important, which when beginners are like, ooh, I wonder what rep range is best for me. It's kind of like, shut up, just do regular lifting and you'll learn. And when you will learn, by the time you learn years later, then you will need it. It's really one of those things. And how do you do this in the real world? You begin with your best guess, usually average conservative guess. You detect the responses. Am I healing on time? Does the squat technique work for me or is another one better? Auto-regulate and change the plan on the margins, not completely throwing things away. Okay, if two time a week training worked okay for you, don't go to five time a week training uh, for the same muscle group, go from two to three, right? Or from four down to three, so on and so forth. Slowly, as indicated, and over time, two things will happen. You'll be making way better gains than you could be, and you'll be learning more and more and more what your body is doing so that you can get better. It's, you know, every single beginning of a meso is to some extent a guess. Like you're gonna do some exercise rotations differently, some rep ranges differently, and you're gonna say, I hope this works. I still say it, I've been training for like 20 years and I'm supposed to be this uh, whatever expert. Every time I make a new meso for myself, I'm like, eh. I think this is gonna work pretty well, but I don't know. Sometimes I do hack squats and then do lunges and I realize like, that's not hitting my glutes at all. It's just all quads. I'm an idiot. I should have seen this coming. Sometimes I could have never seen it coming. So you will get better if you apply individualization over time. But remember, there are always surprises and there's always time for auto-regulation. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time. <laughs>